Hi everyone. Thank you all for joining today for the um, for the presentation. And the key focus of the presentation is going to be how do we accelerate our our AI driven, machine learning driven innovation in our companies in our enterprises. So something has changed pretty significantly in our in our businesses today, and part of that is that the number of companies that are mentioning the use of AI and big data and their earnings calls has shot up quite significantly in the last three to four years. If you look at this curve, it, it things tended to be somewhat, you know, there were about 80-ish companies in like around 2016 that were mentioning the word AI in their earnings calls, which has now gone up to about 800. Now, something that's interesting about it is that not all these companies are actually implementing uh, these AI solutions in a meaningful way. So there was a survey done by uh, IDC where they asked companies uh, if they have had any troubles implementing AI solutions. And only about a quarter of the enterprises that they surveyed responded to this question. And of the people who responded, there was they reported about a 50% failure rate on projects. Now, ignoring the self, you know, self-reporting bias here, there's likely, a, which you know, which likely means there's a higher chance of failure. But even then, if half of your projects are failing, there's a pretty big question that comes up in the mind of executives: How do we get my AI initiatives to deliver benefits? And this is a common question that a lot of people are asking today, given the fact that you know, there are a number of challenges implementing machine learning, you know, things don't really work out of the box as we planned. And um, I was pretty much hired at Levi's to answer a similar question, that how do we get our AI initiatives to deliver benefits? And in the last two years or so, we have really been able to drive a lot of uh, transformation in the company and deliver sort of like, a, like a dozen initiatives that have been ROI positive overall. And what I wanted to share in this presentation was really the six key considerations that you should really ask or have uh, to really transform your business from a place of you know, being sort of lukewarm towards machine learning and AI solutions to actually a place which delivers benefits um, from machine learning. And the presentation is basically going to consist of six key questions that if you can emphatically answer yes to all of them, then I can give you a pretty high, like I can give you a lot of, you know, I'm pretty sure that you'll be able to um, get value out of this, uh, the, the AI initiatives that you have. And so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna basically go through these six key questions and happy to take questions afterwards. So the first question that comes up really is, are you sh really sure that you want AI and machine learning to solve your problem? And this is, you know, sort of, I think, a question that is, you know, sometimes it's often too late. Uh, you know, you already have a team in place and you already have people in the building um, and then you're given a problem to solve. And, you know, I think this question is often asked too late. So it's probably not never too early to ask this question. And it's really about understanding like, you know, what are, you know, what are the key uh, solutions that can be utilized to solve the problem? And do they always have to be uh, machine learning based? So. I think if we just take kind of a kind of a take take a step back, what we can see is that the key value that machine learning or any kind of data driven uh, work brings is to improve our decision making quality. Companies, especially big companies, live and die by the the decisions they make. You know, the big decisions, small decisions, everyday decisions. And this slide by Cassie Kosterkov, I think, encapsulates this quite beautifully as to what what kinds of solutions might actually solve your problem and make your decision making a bit better. So if you're just trying to like, you know, um, if you're just trying to like find some answers to your curiosity, then you probably want descriptive analytics. If you just want to make a few decisions, then you want statistics. If you actually are trying to use data to make lots and lots of decisions, you want machine learning. Which sort of brings me to this slide that I probably use like once a week when I talk to different business stakeholders is that there's an entire spectrum of BI to AI solutions which can solve a problem for, you know, for your business. So for example, if you're just looking to keep an eye on things, follow trends, see what's going on, then probably a BI tool is going to work for you perfectly. And that's where I called what I call our data inspired decisions. And uh, if we take like the metaphor of a car, uh, that's where the human is driving, but the data is navigating. So much like, you know, let's say Google Maps can tell you um, what potential routes you might want to take, but the final decision is still on the human being. Uh, 
On the other end of the spectrum, we have data-driven decisions where the humans are sort of the navigators, which and the humans set the objectives for the algorithm, but all the decisions are completely automatically made by the machine learning algorithm. And there's a vast space in between which falls under data mining analytics and statistical inference, where, where I would say most solutions probably fall in this range where, you know, if you're trying to just investigate issues like why were sales down last week? Why are consumer service representatives getting contacted about this issue? What's going on? I think then you probably want data mining versus, you know, if you're trying to make a decision around like how much product should we buy for next for next quarter and you want to make a good forecast, then, you know, statistical inference is probably going to um, do the job. And really what the core thing to understand is that you know, we don't always have to be on the right side of the spectrum for everything. Some of these things can actually be, some of the problems can be solved by some, you know, problem, solution that exists somewhere along the spectrum. With that in mind, I mean, here's a quick checklist that you can often go through to see if machine learning is the appropriate tool. And I won't go through all these questions. Um, I, I believe the slides and the recording of the presentation will be available so you can go through them by yourselves. But um, the, the litmus test to knowing really if your business is ready or not for using machine learning is this, <laughs> is if you ask your business stakeholders, like, would you trust a pigeon to make the decision? Now, this is not just a, you know, some obscure example. This was actually a test done by the University of uh, San Diego, I believe, where they trained a flock of pigeons to look at some, uh, I believe, some uh, scans of some cancer tissue or some tissue of the body. And they found that um, after a few weeks of training, each pigeon could identify the cancer cells with about 85% accuracy. And if they actually averaged the decision of the entire flock, they got about 99% accuracy. Now, this as sort of as as much of a strawman as this example is, the point that you know I think we want to make is that are really are your business stakeholders really trying to uh, go after the whole, uh, like the, the 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 razzmatazz of using machine learning, or do they actually just want good decisions regardless of where they come from? And these are some of the considerations that you can have that you need to have before you um, even start your journey on the AI machine learning side. Okay, so let's see. You know, we have identified that yes, this is exactly the you know, machine learning is exactly the solution we want to use. The next question that really comes up is that do you really have solid data infrastructure in place? And this is really a question that doesn't get, I would say, enough attention um, in the machine learning sort of community uh, because, but this is really the secret sort of uh, the underlying pipelining, the, the underlying infrastructure that keeps everything running. And so the first, I think this, and this visual sort of encapsulates all of it quite beautifully by, uh, by, and this by Monica Rogati, which I think what she did was that she kind of analogized the Maslow's hierarchy of needs with her, her own sort of AI hierarchy of needs or data science hierarchy of needs, saying that you know oftentimes AI and deep learning are just the tip of the pyramid, and they are the ultimate step in self uh, like compared to self actualization, effectively in some ways. But before that, we need a lot of underlying infrastructure that can actually support some of these operations. And the thing with machine learning and any kind of data driven anal analysis is that. Um, it's 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 a complete garbage in garbage out system uh, where if you are putting bad data into your model, you're gonna get bad results out. Your model might seem very confident; it might still give you 99% accuracy, but that doesn't mean that its predictions have actually any real life meaning. And so it's important to build this foundation. And I think I like to also, and this was actually from a from a very famous paper around uh, you know productionizing machine learning applications, and they kind of, I think, made this point quite well, which was that oftentimes when you look at applications which are running in production, generating value, things like, let's say, recommendation engines, search engines, et cetera, a lot of the effort does not actually go into the machine learning code. It goes into the code that is required to serve this model, make sure that data collection, feature extraction, data verification, all of these things are, are, are in place. And uh, the verbatim quote from them was like, only a tiny fraction of the code in many machine learning systems is actually devoted to learning or prediction. And it's it's a sobering point because oftentimes like this little black box here is what gets most of the attention versus all the stuff around it tends to be neglected. So it's important to make sure that we have this entire infrastructure in place to start thinking about productionizing machine learning in a way that will continue to be scalable and robust and reliable. 
And the analogy I like to use is that of a restaurant, which is also inspired from Cassie Kozergov, where she kind of thinks about the end-to-end -end operations of a restaurant, let's say a pizza kitchen. So data, we can think of them as our ingredients. And you know, we obviously need the best quality ingredients and uh, you know we want to be able to have you know these ingredients prepared so that they can be used by the, the chefs when they're cooking now if you're you know if, if your chef asks for you know onions chopped neatly in and stored in in one buck in one box and tomatoes chopped neatly in one box but instead they get you know a box of pico de gallo that means that at the time that they have to do start cooking they have to now separate the onions from the tomatoes and that can be quite frustrating and delay the the time to delivery of the of the solutions of the products um, the next uh, step is is algorithms, which you can think of as appliances, right? So you need to have appliances that work. So you need ovens, you need uh, stoves, you need knives, you need a lot of different types of appliances in a kitchen, in a in a in a actual real life kitchen to make things work. Now, if these appliances are faulty, if these algorithms do not work, then that's also going to cause a lot of issues, right? Um, if you can't trust that you know your oven is going to maintain a 400 degree temperature consistently for an hour, you can't really trust the outcome. The next step are the recipes, which you can think of as the actual models that are being built. And again, the recipes, let's say if, you're, if your chefs only speak Spanish and the recipes are all in, in French, they're gonna have a hard time. They'll have to first translate the recipe. And in that translation, there can often be some trouble and you know, discrepancies which might completely lead the, you know, the, the final product to be astray. And finally, we have predictions, which are effectively our dishes. And these are what the end consumer likes to utilize. And the thing is that before the, the entire path to get to these predictions has to go through this entire step of, of, of obtaining the right data, using the right algorithms, uh, using the right models to then finally create the right predictions. And if there are delays in any part of the way, there's gonna be delays in either the number of predictions you can serve or in the timeliness or both. And that can often lead to a lot of different um, issues and you know concerns from your end consumers of, of the machine learning applications. Now let's say you have built that foundation, but now do you have the right team? And I think this is a question that can be very touchy for people because a lot of people when they join companies, uh, enterprises especially to lead machine learning initiatives, they don't always have a team in place that's you know up and running. They often have to work with people who are already there and then bring the right people. And it can often be tricky to build the right team in place like this. And so I think the metaphor I like to use is that of a warehouse, which is that if you think about what are the skills which are needed to run a successful warehouse, right? So the their obvious answer would be like operating a forklift, like being able to follow instructions very directly, being able to uh, follow procedures and measure everything and you know follow a schedule, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of this you know, very like um, process-driven culture that that exists in a warehouse but then if you think about a boutique like what kind of a team would you need to run a successful boutique right you would need people who are really good working with customers really good at understanding what their needs are showing them products that maybe they might be interested in upselling cross-selling you know stocking the the shelves with the right products creating the right aesthetic etc right so there's a very different type of skill set that's required to run a boutique but then if you think about it a boutique can't really run without a you know a warehouse, right? You need both skill sets uh, to be able to run a successful boutique business. And the thing is that these skill sets uh, for people who are running up the boutique and people running a warehouse are not the same. And I think I don't have to belabor the point, but the key point is that whoever is in charge of running this end-to-end -end business needs to be somebody who can coordinate work between your process-driven warehouse employees and your relationship-oriented boutique employees. And while they speak very different languages and think very differently, um, you know, a successful team has to be able to work together and incorporate both these types of mindsets uh, to, to build a successful machine learning team. And what does this team look like? Uh, it has its own set of uh, you know, uh, talents and skill sets. So you need to have people who are like DevOps uh, engineers, data engineers, you do have project managers, data scientists, business stakeholders, consumer insights, subject matter experts. And then I think one of the core roles which a lot of these teams need are a technical product manager, which I think often is the glue that binds these the process-oriented world with the relationship-oriented world. And 
the thing is that there, the technical product manager has a number of responsibilities which may or may not be fulfilled uh, you know because a lot of times i see companies not having these roles in place or if there is a person in this role they're really kind of working as a project manager and not really as a product manager and oftentimes what happens is that some people in other teams will end up picking the slapping of the slack or they just don't do it and there's a lot of swirl and a lot of like question marks around what's actually happening what are we doing etc and so one of the key responsibilities of a technical product manager are you know your vision and roadmap development understanding the consumer needs and wants creating a product strategy um, ideation and solutioning around what kinds of what kinds of uh, solutions might actually help your help solve your customer needs connecting ideas with the world vision goal setting kpis okrs prioritizing task execution acquiring domain knowledge technical fluency and really last but not the least uh, having really good cross-functional communication across these various teams. And these are some of the core core uh, points that I think uh, we need um, a technical product manager to, uh, to fulfill, without which the team can often fall apart. And so it's important to like have somebody in that role. And I mean, I really can't believe the point enough to say that please hire somebody who fits the bill. They might not be your standard product manager that you might have in your company. You might have to hire somebody from a tech company, but uh, if you are someone good, it's going to be worth the investment. <laughs> um, and the next point, and this is something which I feel again is it's it can be a very sensitive topic to discuss, uh, but again, I really can't stress this enough: is that are you really willing to fail? And I think this gets to the I think heart of the issue that you know that a lot of machine learning applications they're not silver bullets; they're not going to be um, you know something that you can implement on the website and within. A few, you know, a few days, you will see magic happening. A lot of times, the performance is not going to be predictable. A lot of times, things are not going to necessarily play out the way you want them to. And hence, what might happen is that you might not necessarily meet the objective that you had set out. And and in a lot of places, in a lot of companies, that can look like failure. And I mean, I know fail. The word failure can often be a triggering four-letter word for a lot of people. But I think. When we think about machine learning, this is probably one of the largest organizational mindset changes that has to take place. And a lot of that sort of comes from, I think, the fact that, you know, when failure is not an option, innovation and creativity are not an option, right? So I think in a lot of places, we are so tied to our objectives and we are so tied to meeting certain goals that we are not willing to go beyond what is sort of set in the roadmap and go beyond what we know will deliver. And that really hinders our ability to innovate, our ability to try out new things, and really ends up hindering the whole process of developing good machine learning applications. And you know, I think there's and you know, there's two ways to think about it, right? There's like I think there was this book that came out recently, like you know, a few years ago, which I think like almost achieved achieved uh, cult status, which was called the growth mindset. And I think that really signifies this transition that businesses have to make to start leveraging machine learning to drive value, which is moving from the fixed mindset where failures are looked upon as catastrophic events that should never be repeated and we should do everything possible to avoid them, to looking at failures um, as an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to do new cool things. And uh, Seth Godin actually makes a great point about like differentiating between failures. You know, Is this really uh, a, a terminal failure or is this a learning failure? And terminal failure basically is that the game is over, you can't play again, you're done. And think of it as, let's say, like a startup running out of funding, they don't get to, you know, they don't have any money, they have to shut their, their business down, right? Most enterprises are probably not in that in that space, especially when it comes to applying machine learning. They already have their uh, processes which are working, and it's not really about uh, looking at failures as a terminal event. It's really about thinking of it as like, you know, yes, we tried something new, it didn't work, what did we learn from that, and how can we use that to do do things better the next time? And I think that shift is some of the hardest uh, change that has to be brought about. I think some of the other things that I mentioned, which was like around like, you know, getting the right technology in place, getting the right people in place, I think tend to be a lot easier than at, like changing the, the mindset of your leaders and various business stakeholders to adapt this growth, growth mindset. And what this often entails is this willingness to fail faster first. And I think it, this this idea is like perfectly encapsulated by this quote from Frank Lloyd, who's basically said, you can use an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. And you know, if you think about this, right? If you think about your project timeline, right? Um, if you really start trying something out, and you know, I think one of the key things about machine learning is that uh, the th there are many ways to build an application, but uh, one way to build it 
is to build something end to end and then improve upon it as you go along. What happens there is that if you just build something quick and dirty, it helps you test out you know, if the solution is actually working or not. And then if it fails, the price that you're really paying at that point is just your ego. You know, you know, you might be thinking it's like the best thing out there, it's best thing since sliced bread. Implement it, it doesn't work. You know, you're like you're humbled, right? But you learn something. But if you continue on this path where you just build without testing and you just keep, you know, adding more and more developer hours to the to the um, to the solution, and then you launch something and then it fails, then the price that you you pay there is your reputation. And guess what your business cares more about? Their reputation or your ego, right? And so it's really important to keep that, keep this mindset of like failing early on and failing and being the first to fail and really like kind of like, you know, almost making it a race to like have as many failures as possible before you actually launch something. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, that fail, you know, failing sort of um, on purpose is a good thing, but the point there is that, you know, you, you want to be de developing to the best of your abilities, but if you fail, then that's actually a good learning opportunity for you. And that often requires this really abandoning this comfort of this like linear waterfall process, like looking at Gantt charts. And I can't tell you how many companies I talk to who are like, oh yeah, we're totally agile. But then when I ask them, like, can you show me project planning sheets? They often look like this. So it often means that abandoning the comfort of the linear into the messiness of a design process which you know, I think one of the key things to understand is in any, um, in any sort of machine learning project, you can often be in an explorer phase, which is the phase here, and then in the execute phase, which is right over here. And the thing is that the explore phase often looks like this. There's no like linear line there. It can look like, you know, at some point it might look like, you feel like you're going back, and at some point you even feel like you're, you're going up and down in all directions. But once you get to a phase where you know that yes, we are at a point we can start executing, then your linear, uh, your, your your linear phase of execution comes along. But the thing is that to get here in the execution phase, you have to first embrace this messiness that comes along with it. And um, I think that often requires retraining your scrum masters, your project managers, your your finance people to understand that yes, there is more to this project than just like a series of steps that have to be executed. And then eventually you want to get to truly agile, truly cyclical iterative design processes, which um, I think one of the best processes out there, which I personally live by quite a lot, quite ardently is called design thinking. And it's a phase where you start empathizing with your consumers, understand what their pain points are, define what their problem statement is, ideate around, the uh, ideate around some solutions that might solve these problems, prioritize some solutions, test them out in the market, see how they work, implement the stuff that works, and then based on the implementation, understand what the new features are required by the consumers to really solve their pain points, and then use that to, again, empathize with the consumers and then keep going on with the cycle. And one of the key, I would say, analogies I'd like to use here is that I think in a lot of places where you know the idea of progress is almost tied to this notion of forward motion, um, I think people have a hard time accepting the fact that we might be going backwards. Right. So the thing is that if you are truly like, you know, if you're if you're if you if people haven't really moved out of the waterfall mindset, what will happen is that any notion of like going back to the design board can feel like, you know, can feel like a red alarm can be like red alert, basically. But the way I like to uh, convey this to people is that think about this as a wheel, uh, the cycle as a wheel. So at, at some point of time, let's say you're at the top of the wheel here, the next quadrant of your motion is going to feel like forward progress. But then when you start going back to some of the other phases, it might feel like you're going back in the process and it might feel like you know, you're know you not actually making forward progress. But if you think about the overall wheel itself, it is still driving the car forward, right? It's not it's not that the car is, is, is not moving forward. It's that the point, of the, uh, the point on the wheel that you're at might feel like you're going forward or backwards. And it's really, I think, giving up that that sort of false notion of, we always have to be moving forward, and at all points we need to be showing we we have made progress. I think we this this is progress. It just doesn't feel like progress if you're, you know, on the wheel and not in the car. So hopefully that analogy makes sense. Uh, but I think it's important to embrace this uh, this 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 really cyclical process of design when you start thinking about building machine learning applications. And I think one of the key methodologies that we like to uh, leverage here are. Uh, sort of like really testing and prototyping often and early. 
so that you can really validate your assumptions as quickly as possible before you implement anything in production. Because you know, as we I think as we discussed product, you know, early on, right? It's like productionizing something requires a lot of different pieces, a lot of different, uh, um, um, like infrastructure to really make it work end to end. But there's an easier way out. You know, you can actually think of it, I think taking our car analogy forward, let's say the business need is to go from point A to point B. If we just deliver, you know, a you know, if we just deliver like a wheel, a transmission, the the chassis, and then the final car, then that means that the business needs are not met up until the final car is delivered. But if we instead deliver a skateboard, which I think doesn't probably require any technology. It's very low-fi product. It can, you know, the consumer might not be happy, but it might still be, you know, enough to get them moving. Uh, then we might upgrade that to like a scooter, based upon the fact that they people might say, oh, I'm, "I'm having trouble steering this." Then we might be able to deliver a bike, which bicycle, which might, you know, increase their efficiency and deliver, but but still might not be great. To then a motorcycle, which is now, which now means that they don't have to put in as much effort um, into going from point A to point B, and then finally deliver this car, because turns out they didn't actually want this sedan. They actually wanted like a convertible, let's say. And a lot of that can be discovered as you go through the cycle of delivering things iteratively. And so it's important to adopt this like crawl, walk, run mindset when you deliver uh, machine learning projects. And the other thing is to really start with like low fidelity testing. And I think when we say prototypes, I think a lot of pe times people think of it as a as an Instead of a you know an app that is fully featured, they think of it as an app with just two features in it. And I would say there's an even more lo-fi way of testing, which uh, there's a term for it, which is called Wizard of Oz testing. So in the Wizard of Oz, for example, there was this um, story where there was a man behind the curtain who was controlling what was happening in front of the curtain. So people thought, you know, it's it's there's basically magic happening, right? In some ways. Um, and what you can do is that you can do something similar when you're trying to test out a machine learning application. Oftentimes, training an algorithm, building it out requires GPUs and like requires a lot of investment, hiring data scientists, and it can be quite expensive, can, can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, which means that testing the core tenet of your idea might, might not be possible for you if you're just like a single developer trying to build something out or if you're just you know, in, in a large company because getting those kinds of budgets approved can be quite tricky. So what you can actually do is that you can fake the experience by building a mock the application. Um, and so, and you know, we have often done it by just using paper, like piece of paper with boxes drawn in them, right? And I can uh, potentially uh, share some of those later on. But the key idea there is that you can literally draw you know, boxes. Let's say you're mocking up a, a, a search experience or recommendation carousel or a chat bot, for example. You can show people like, okay, this is what this experience is going to look like. It's how it's going to feel like. This is what this bot is going to do. And you can actually, you know, it doesn't have to be AI. It can be, you know, natural intelligence, right? It can be your human intelligence driving that. And you can fake the experience enough to get what are the key characteristics of this experience that really delight this consumer that I'm working with, and then how can we incorporate that in our model? And that really helps you define the key objectives, uh, key objective functions for your algorithm to optimize on. Because at the end of the day, like I think one of the things that is true about our machines is that we need to make them artificially intelligent because they're naturally stupid. So it, they need to have objectives defined by us humans, and you can define those objectives a lot better if you start with very low-fi testing, and then actually start spend time on building your machine learning model. So. Let's say you've done all of that. Let's say you have adopted the right mindset. Um, the question then becomes like, are you really solving the right problems? And a lot of times, what it comes down to is the fact that, you know, we tend to um, we tend to be sort of very hyper focused on implementing something that works. And I think sometimes a lot of failure stems from the fact that we're not solving the real, the right problem with machine learning. And so, as an example of that, I think if if I asked you, let's say, you know name some companies that you think are really good at using machine learning and have really made a mark for themselves through the application of machine learning and AI. I think some of the standard names that will come out are you know, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, Netflix, et cetera, right? Um, the core thing there, though, is that when you look at their business model and the fact that they've been so successful, um, it is not purely due to the fact that they're using machine learning and AI. I mean, they're definitely that definitely does contribute. There's definitely a lot of value that they generate by using these uh, machine learning applications. But the core, at the heart of their business model, is the fact that they're solving a consumer need in a way that 
their incumbents either did not or could not solve. So let's say, for example, Netflix, they did start off by, you know, by selling DVDs, but they, I think, quickly realized that people don't want to put on pants and go to a store to buy, to watch a movie. They would much rather just like sit in their comfort, their home on, in their, you know, in their pajamas and watch a movie on their computers instead. Um, same thing with Uber, you know, they didn't really kill off taxis because of the use of machine learning. I think machine learning is definitely part of their, uh, their, their route planning algorithm and the pricing algorithms. But really the core thing that they did was that they gave people the control over, um, um, over the price that they want to pay and the convenience of tapping a button and getting a ride, right? So at the end of the day, I think the core point here is that at the end of the day, like a good customer experience will often beat fancy AI. And I think that's, I think, I, I feel like that's a point that's not necessarily as as often um, accepted or as often uh, said out loud that as it should. And I think a lot of times when we, you know, as as business leaders and executives think about implementing um, AI applications, let's say a chatbot, we often imagine things like Jarvis, which uh, if you, some of you who might be into Marvel movies might know this as this uh, very intelligent chatbot that uh, that Iron Man uses and can, you know, execute any command that Iron Man asks it to execute. Uh, but oftentimes what happens is that when we start off with the idea of building an interior Jarvis, we end up building something like Clippy. Now, some of you might have worked with Microsoft Word back in the 90s and early 2000s might remember this this entity. And I think there was pretty massive uh, uh, sort of pushback against pe from people against using it because they felt it was like really annoying, right? Um, I don't know how many of you feel that it was annoying, but... Uh, it, but if you think about it, like, you know, what was annoying about it? Was it the fact that it felt like a coworker overlooking your shoulder? Or was it the fact that it's recommendations around, like, looks like you're writing a letter, right? Was the recommendations which were wrong? So I think most people, when they talk about it being annoyed by Clippy, it's not because that they were annoyed by the recommendations it made. It was mostly annoyed by the way it provided those recommendations. And I think that's, at the end of the day, like, you know, Microsoft was probably using the state-of-the-art algorithms back then in the 90s to create Clippy. The point though is that the customer experience that was associated with it was not necessarily the best, and that's why it was more annoying and people didn't really like it. And hence, like it's really important to focus on the, the right customer experience when you're thinking about you know building uh, the problem and building the solution to the problem. And like, don't take my word for it. Steve Jobs actually said that quite succinctly, which was that you have to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. I think oftentimes as machine learning practitioners, we tend to get so excited by a solution that we just want to like build an algorithm and you know we all it all often ends up being a hammer looking for a nail. But really we have to look at it at it from a consumer standpoint and see how can we work towards the technology that would solve this problem. And I think in my um, sort of work, line of work over the last decade or so. What I've understood is that there are two types of problem classes and they both require very different types of solutions. And a lot of trouble often comes from not really understanding which class of problem are we trying to solve. So the two distinct classes are building data-driven products, which I'm showing here, and making data-driven decisions. Both of these are very important. Both of these leverage machine learning and AI solutions, but you're solving a very different problem. And so, a data-driven product, you know, for example, can be something like a recommendation engine, a chatbot, a search engine. A data-driven decision could be anything that your business wants to do, which might be around, let's say, you know, determining your product assortment for next quarter. It might be determining where to open a store next year. It might be around um, how much money do we want to invest in expanding our customer service center, for example. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think what happens is a lot of times like companies are not very uh, prescient about what problem they're solving and it can often lead to um, a number of issues. And so what are the characteristics of these types of problems? So a different product, for example, starts with identification of an opportunity space where you identify an unmet customer desire and which has a strong business case to be pursued. After that, you start off by doing some exploratory data analysis based upon the data that's available, and uh, you look at sort of what data can indicate how what the consumers want and how can we can solve their problems. Then you build a model, and uh, 
you need to deploy that model using you know all the different solutions we talked about, and then you impl employ testing and experimentation approaches to really see if this solution is working or not, and then you rinse and repeat. And I think a lot of times when people think about machine learning, they tend to think about these types of products, like these type this this class of problems, which are data driven products. But a lot of times, a lot of the key problems that need to be solved by by a business tend to be in this bucket, which is they just want to make better data data driven decisions, and they want some way of making sure that these decisions are actually more accurate and are giving the right results that they are the, the right outcomes that they desire. And this problem has to be approached with a very different type of mindset. So the process here is first clearly identifying the problem. And I can't tell you how many times uh, we have spent more than half of our effort in just this step. Um, because oftentimes what happens is that, you know, the business leaders might have a problem that can sound very, you know, simple, uh, but can actually be very complex when you start to like, define it clearly. So let's say they say, we want, to, we want to detect fraud better. Well, what does fraud mean? We want to like, identify loyal customers, but what does loyal mean, right? And so um, often these terms, which, you know, I think have a lot of meaning to us, become very hard to define to a computer and defining that problem becomes very important. And there, once the problem is defined, then you want to collect the data uh, that might be out there, which can help you you know, measure some of these intangibles in some ways. After that, you want to, again, spend some of this time to craft important hypotheses based upon the data that you have collected and the problem statement that you have identified. And there's often a sort of a, a cyclical step here of based upon the data, can we define this problem a lot better, right? Um, and so let's say you're, con we, you know, as part of your definition of what a consumer is, you, uh, your business might say, yeah, we don't care about people who buy gift cards. Um, we, we don't consider them as loyal consumers because they're not necessarily buying from us directly. But it might turn out that people who buy gift cards end up creating a network of people who end up buying from you as a, as a company, in which case these people are some of your most, most smart consumers because they're really like doing the job of a, of, a, like a, of, a, of a salesperson for you or a marketer for you better than anyone you know, any who works for your company could, right? And once you have analyzed and refined the problem statement, then you want to implement a solution which could be a simple statistical model, it could be simple you know, VBA macro in Excel, whatever that might be. And then you wanna test your hypothesis and validate if what you have actually discovered is true. And if that is actually correct, then you wanna deploy your solutions, in which case you have now solved a, a problem that can now be leveraged a lot better in the, in the future. And I think uh, the simplest, I would say, methodology to think about how we might be able to solve, find the right problems to solve is this idea of finding uh, problems that lie at the intersection of consumer uh, desirability, um, uh, consumer desirability, sorry, I think, uh, consumer desirability, uh, technology feasibility, and business viability. And what I mean by that is that, you know, let's say you did some consumer surveys and you identified uh, some desires your customer, customers have, some needs that they have expressed very clearly. Uh, they might say, you know, they want free one-hour deliveries on all orders, regardless of what item they're ordering. Uh, they want to purchase their, you know, uh, favorite celebrities look from a from an event. And uh, they want to, you know, when they're shopping online, they have a hard time understanding the feel of the garment. So they want to touch their phone screens and be able to feel the garment virtually. And I apologize that these examples are all from retail. That's primarily because I work in retail. But you can imagine, you know, a number of examples that might really relevant to your industry as well. Now, these are things that your customers desire, right? If you don't deliver this, then they're going to be like, meh, I don't care. Now you go to the business, and the business says, you know what? I don't think it, it's going to pencil out if we deliver every product within one hour for free, because what if somebody orders, like, just, you know, a pair of socks? Like, how are we going to, like, justify the, the $20 shipping costs associated with, with that, right? So we can't do that. But everything else, like, if it's feasible, then why not? Let's go forward with it. And then when you look at it from the technology perspective, you'll, you know, your technologist might say, yeah, you know, we don't really have that kind of haptic technology at this point where you can just touch the garment and actually be able to feel what it feel what the fabric feels like. But you know, we could use a bunch of computer vision techniques and some recommendation engines to then uh, find the look, you know, if you enter like an image or something, or if you enter a search term that we can then like relate it to like, you know, some shop the look type experiences. And you know, that really is what is your winning idea. 
because if you end up picking some of the any of the other ideas for example let's say you pick this free one hour delivery thing then you know yes from a technology perspective that can be done you know you can with pencil kind of travel and salesman problem to make it efficient it's still never going to pencil out from a business standpoint and they're going to kill the idea if you if instead you prioritize this other idea then technology is not going to be able to build it they're going to get frustrated people are going to leave it's going to be a failure they'll try to build something that doesn't work and if you build something that's out of this box out of out of these set of ideas out of which lies outside the circle then the consumer is not going to want it and you're not going to get success anyway and so it's really important to like find this innovation speed spot and focus on those problems there now after you've identified those uh, problems uh, that you want to be solving i think it's important to also then initiate like prioritize those initiatives because you know i think one of the key things that happens is that i think we tend to go with whichever problem you know people tend to be most excited about but i think there's a more quantifiable way of approaching this which is to look at, I think there's a framework called RICE, which is uh, reach, impact, uh, confidence, and effort. Uh, and I think sort of that can be encapsulated within this, this like two by two effort impact matrix. So basically, you know, if you think about projects which uh, have you know low effort, low impact, right? Then those are initiatives that you may want to take, but are not necessarily like you know your bread and butter. But then there are efforts, problems which are like high effort, low impact, and these are like really thankless tasks, and you really want to be avoiding them like the plague. But then you have things here which are low effort and high impact, right? And so this is what the proverbial low hanging fruit is, right? And you really should be focusing on these things. Um, and then there's like, you know, your major projects, like the stuff that, you know, you, like often tends to be like filling up most of your project roadmap, uh, which are these major projects which are high effort, high impact. But it's important to like, before you look at these solving these initiatives to like plot them along these axes and actually do some calculations around like, what is the potential reach of this, of this uh, solution that you're implementing? What might be the impact? Like how much the, how might the conversion go up or how, how much by by how much might the CSAT go up, right, by putting these solutions? Um, and then you want to look into how confident are we in, uh, into the fact that we can deliver this on time, on budget, and this will actually have the impact that we think it would, and then how much effort is required in that. So then you can actually plot these things on the axis and you can find a pretty good way of uh, prioritizing initiatives. Uh, but I would say that's not the only thing. You should also think of it in, in terms of the Eisenhower matrix, which is, which items are important but not urgent, important and urgent, important but not, not important but urgent, and not important and not urgent, right? So obviously we're gonna stop doing these things, and if things are not important but they're urgent, we want them to be delegated to somebody else. And I think this is where I feel like a lot of companies end up making a trade-off between items that fall here, which are important and not urgent, uh, versus items which are not important but urgent. And you know, I think it's important to like figure out like in which interests fall in which bucket and really try to see if we can move away from this bucket here over to this bucket here. And obviously the things which are important, urgent, like, you know, we're going to all focus on. So no, you know, not rocket science, no rocket science there. I think one of the final points there is to just be very careful about choosing the right metrics, right? So this is around uh, when you're prioritizing your, I think I talked a lot about, you know, thinking about it from uh, the, the RICE framework of quantifying your impact and uh, quantifying the, uh, the effort. So it's important to really like choose the right metric and not really get, you know, sort of uh, influenced too much by the incorrect metrics because it's, you know, it's, it's easy to like look at numbers and make meaning out of them. And so uh, I think we should always think about like, how can we quantify the intangibles in the right kinds of metrics? And the final one is, you know, I think no company out there, I would say, is working on every project all by themselves. And you often have to work with other external vendors out there who are providing solutions to you. And I think something that is interesting is that there was an IDC report also recently that said that a lot of the you know spending on AI systems will be led by retail and banking sectors. And I think this 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 box in the red here, I think tend to be industries which are not necessarily as technology or forward and I think tend to be lagging on the AI side. And this is sort of kind of like, you know, the, the red zone for you know being sort of approached by a number of vendors, a number of companies who are trying to sell you solutions. And so it becomes important to work with the right kinds of vendors. Now, something uh, uh, interesting that has happened on the on the AI startup side is that companies with like .ai domains tend to raise like three and a half times more money than companies that don't. And that's really, I think if you think about it, right, it's like, you know, all these companies now have .ai domains. Like, do you really think everyone is like implementing actual AI-based solutions? If your hunch is no, then you're actually quite correct 
because you know there's this joke that goes around, which is like you know when you're fundraising, it's AI; when you're hiring, it's machine learning; when implementing, it's linear regression; and you're debugging, it's printf, right? So a lot of it is like for show. And it turns out that there was a survey done, and uh, this report found out that about 40% of AI startups in Europe have almost nothing to do with AI, even though they claim they're using a lot of AI, right? And this can often be, you know, very um, uh, quite uh, quite a shock for a lot of companies because, you know, these people when they when you talk to them, they're using all the right words, but they're not, you know, really using the right technology. And oftentimes you will see that these companies will come with large, like you know, really amazing claims to say that they're you know leveraging all this technology and like really bamboozle with a lot of statistics. And I think that leads to this phase where I think a lot of executives like just kind of feel clueless about what's actually happening versus AI startups like who are really at the peak confidence of thinking that they can really accomplish anything are really at the phase where they haven't really done enough to know what are the uh, limitations of the algorithms that they've created. And hence, like, it's it's very important to then have like a good checklist of what are the right criteria for you know working with a vendor. And again, not, I'm not saying that this is the definitive checklist that everyone should be using, but but it is one that we use here, um, and which I think can be helpful. You should definitely add your own criteria here. But I think understanding like you know is there really a benefit of working with this company? I think you can use this kind of a checklist to identify that. Basically, the idea is that if the answer to any of these questions are, is a no, we should probably ignore working with them. And the other, I think, the other set of checklists are, you know, around the fact that, you know, yes, the vendor might be somebody who is exciting to work with, but they have have they really achieved product market fit? And this is like this like this mystical moment that happens in a startup's journey where, once they reach product market fit, it's almost like you know they gain this momentum that becomes that makes them unstoppable. But until then, a lot of time and money is spent on like building the right solution. And you know what might happen is that they might implement something for you, but they might just run out of money because they haven't reached product market fit, right? And so it's important to understand like has the startup or vendor you're working with reached that point, and then it makes it a little bit easier for you to work with them. Now, I'm not saying that don't work with any startup that hasn't reached this point, but it's preferable to lower your risks to uh, work with somebody, a company that has reached product market fit. So with that, I think that's all I have for today. Um, we covered quite a few things, um, you know, around the six considerations on exiting your journey. Um, and thank you again. And you know, open to any questions now. Okay, let's see. Let me open the questions tab. Oh, okay. So I think one of the questions here is, how do you define team roles? So um, the the role of the team really is that. You know, we want it to be. Um, maybe let's let me go through the slide real quick uh, to the team slide. I think uh, primarily, you know, these are standard roles that I would say are associated with people, oops, with machine learning teams. And I think in a really good team, a lot of these roles can blend into each other. So a data engineer and a and a DevOps person might have some shared, you know, commonalities. A, a data analyst and a data scientist might have a lot of commonalities. And the idea there is that you kind of want to uh, find people who can work together and care less about the titles and position, et cetera. And I think really kind of look at people with the right mindsets. And I think those mindsets have become the most important attribute of a team. And um, I think at the end of the day, like, you know, this team may or may not work for you. And like, you kind of want to have an approach where you can almost like send out a SWAT team to solve the right kind of problem. So it's really defined by the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, the next question is, how do you determine what to work on and what to not? So I think a lot of that uh, ends up falling under the bucket of, uh, um, you know, what is one, like sort of your business, what are your business strategic business priorities? What are things that your consumers are really asking for? And what are the kinds of solutions that you really can feasibly build or buy? Because if it's not really falling in any of those buckets, then it can be really challenging for you to work on that problem. But also the other piece of it is to look into the, the RICE framework, which I think can be quite beneficial. It's R-I-C-E, uh, RICE. And uh, you can look it up. It's, it's, it's actually pretty simple and intuitive to follow. And I think that can often uh, bring a pretty strong data-driven perspective. And uh, Jim Barksdale, who was like a VP at, uh, I believe he's a VP at, at Microsoft, used to say this quote, which is like, um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you have data, then let's look at the data. If you only, if you only have opinions, then let's go with mine, right? So the, the answer, the idea there is like, 
you always want to start from a data perspective, but again, you want to be using the right metrics and not just like made up metrics out there. Um, are there startups that you work with? How do you identify the good ones? So yes, so there are definitely startups that we have worked with, and uh, a couple of them are, for example, um, there's a there's a company called Dataiku that makes a good data science platform that we work with. We work with this company called Mosaic that is really good at uh, building a solutions. We you know solutions for us like uh, like a good build partner. We work with companies like Launchpad, Lynx. And I think at the end of the day, um, it it ends up being um, it ends up being about sort of, I think, looking at some of these criteria to identify which are the right ones. So like, you know, are they really solving your specific problem? Or are they trying to solve like a broad generic problem? Are they, for example, are they trying to say that you're building a search engine for all uh, websites or are they really trying to build search engine for your, you know, retail website, for example? Um, you know, or do they have a technology mode, for example? Like, you know, do they have something that really differentiates them from other companies or are they just like, you know, using the same open source packages and Kaggle kernels that everyone else is? Um, you know, are they trying to do something that's beyond just like expert deep learning, right? So there's all these kind of things that you can use to determine the good ones to work with. The next question was best resource for learning uh, on how to do deep learning. So I think there are many resources, and it really depends upon sort of how you. I think that's it's one of those great things about you know today because back when I started like learning about deep learning, which is like in uh, 2011, I think there weren't that many resources and um, uh, out there, but I think today, like you know, you can take an in-person course. You can go online and like you know, take a you know one of those MOOCs. You can read a book. There, but there are many ways out there. I think I personally learn best by doing, and so to me, the way I think about it is like you know, it's really think about it from a perspective of like, is there a problem that I want to solve? Let's say, and so one of the problems I was discussing recently with my uh, with my friend was like you know. You know, on the radio, we have all of these uh, ads that are coming up. You know, can we build an ad blocker for uh, for radio, for example, right? Now, that's starting from an actual problem that you have. And uh, then what you can do is that then you can do some research on what people are doing. And there are actually a couple applications out there. And they can start, like, prototyping solutions and see how they work, right? And so it's a great way to get into deep learning because even though it might not end up being a great product that and that everyone's like changes everyone's lives it's actually a great way to keep yourself motivated to keep learning the process um that uh that requ that's required to like build a good deep learning solutions because deep learning is like i would say as much art as it's science today mainly because of the fact that there aren't like very theoretically rigorous uh, methods that have been proven to work and uh, i think people often just use trial and error to like, you know, make, get the models to train better. So a lot of it depends upon sort of, I think, how curious are you to, um, uh, how curious and how passionate are you and how driven are you to actually implement this and, uh, and learn about deep learning? And final question is, how do you communicate to executives that have bought into the hype of AI and believe that AI can solve all the problems? Um, I think a good lit litmus test is, I think, giving them that pigeon story um, and I found that to be quite effective because I think it, it. The good thing about it is that it's like sort of getting to the heart of the problem without actually offending anyone, which is the point that you know at the end of the day, like you know what what you know do executives really want like accurate predictions, or do they really want to say that they're using AI, right? Because saying that I'm using a pigeon is like not as sexy as saying you know I'm using like a multi GPU cluster instance in you know in Oregon or something, right? Um, and I think that can really get to the heart of the question. And you can then slowly start working with them to identify like, you know, what about it? What about the AI hype are they looking to get into, right? Because there are many ways that AI can be helpful. You know, it can actually help you increase your stock prices, right? So I think if you go back to the initial example of the number of companies trying to increase their, you know, to talk about, to mention AI in their in their earnings calls, a lot of that is because they want to look, you know, sexy and they want to look um, like that they are, you know, doing something cool. In which case, I would say I think it's reason it's completely reasonable to have you know work with some kind of a vendor who's like providing an out of the box AI solution so that it checks a box and the, and the leaders can actually see that they're using AI. But in the meantime, while that's going on, you can actually focus on the problems that are actually going to deliver value over the long term and which are more sustainable solutions. And so there's often this like mindset of um, what you know what helps us get the shiny object out of the door fast while solving the the foundation problems that exist today. So uh, I think that's all the questions, and I think we're already at time. So thank you again so much for having me today and uh, for listening to me. Happy to connect over LinkedIn and answer any other questions um, at ODSC when I'm there.